the book of the Revelation to John contains John's vision of the risen Christ and the promise of the life that is to come. At the end of that vision, we find these words. The 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, I am going to begin reading at the 8th verse. This is the word of God. I, John, am he who saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But the angel said to me, You must not do that, for I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren the prophets and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And the angel said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Then Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Therefore, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside the gates are the dogs and the sorcerers and the fornicators and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright morning star. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon this earth and be an atheist, but I cannot conceive how he could look up into the heavens and say there is no God. Surely that is true. This earth is fair, yes, but the heavens which cradle it are fairer than the fair. The heavens are ablaze with the glory of God. The stars in their shimmering loveliness speak of God's majesty. The stars in their measured courses speak of God's providence. The stars in their fiery power speak of God's sovereignty. I cannot conceive how anyone can look into the heavens and say, there is no God. I think I first came to fully appreciate that statement of Abraham Lincoln's when I journeyed to the land where Jesus lived. I remember, for example, hiking through the scorching heat of the Negev Desert in southern Israel, that place where the day's light is switched off in an instant and where the night swoops over you in seconds, that place where the tumbleweed rattles all night long in wind-driven journeys across barren wastes, 
that place where the lonely echoing howl of a wild beast sends a shiver down the spine. It was, I think, the darkest, loneliest, most fearsome place I have ever been. And yet even there in that desperate desert, when I looked up to the heavens, the stars in their unobscured splendor staggered me with their beauty as they shot tiny threads of light into that seemingly impenetrable darkness. I remember in the north of Israel, up near the border with Syria and Lebanon, climbing the heights of Mount Hermon, an enormous mountain peak jutting so far up into the Middle Eastern sky that there was snow on its slopes even in July. As the light drained out of the day and the night oozed in, accompanied by the moaning of an icy wind, I looked overhead and the cascading stars above seemed to me to be like some great glittering waterfall. And just the sight of them cheered my chilled spirit. And I remember sailing on the Sea of Galilee after a long and hectic day, and then encountering there on the sea an even more hectic storm, so that wind and wave and rain conspired to scream like banshees, and the tentacles of fear choked off our conversation, and the inky curtain of the night dropped its sinister pall over us. But suddenly, we looked up, and between a break in the storm clouds, there was a single star shining steadily. And that single steady star steadied our storm-tossed souls. Go anywhere where the night is dark, and you will learn to love the stars. And of course, what's true in our experience in the physical world is just as true in our experience of the spiritual world. I think it is no accident that the very last words from the lips of Jesus that are written on the pages of the Bible, words he spoke to be sure, but the very last words that we read on the very last page of the Bible, those words from the lips of Jesus are these, I am the bright morning star. What an incredible claim and an equally incredible promise. It is said that the night is the darkest just before the dawn, and therefore the brightest star in the skies is the star which shines always in that deep darkness just before the dawn. It is the morning star. And when we see the morning star, we know that the night is almost over, that soon the darkness will give way to the dawn. Encompassed now by that image, I want to ask you to consider with me how Jesus Christ, the bright morning star, shines in your life and in mine. Think, for example, how Jesus Christ, the bright morning star, brings light to darkened minds. Let's be frank here. Let's be honest enough to admit that there are times in our experience where we wonder if God exists, where we wonder if there is any ultimate meaning or purpose to life. There, there may even be times when we feel like echoing Voltaire's final verdict on life. Voltaire said life is nothing more than just a bad joke. 
Oh, I don't know that, that any of us ever really say that out loud, but I suspect if we are honest, there have been times when we have thought such thoughts. And after all, we are living in a time of enormous scientific and intellectual prowess, a time of great sophistication in terms of our understanding of the world about us. And it's easy in such circumstances to lightly cast aside the things and the thoughts of faith. Those kinds of thoughts have ever been yours, then I have a word for you, not my word, but Christ's word. Christ says, I am the bright morning star. Jesus Christ is the brightest light shining in the darkness of this world. Jesus Christ changes things in life and changes the way we view life. It's like centuries ago when the Greek runner was dispatched from Marathon to carry the news of the victory to the waiting city of Athens. For 26 long miles, this hastening hero ran, ran so hard and so fast that when at last he arrived in Athens, he could utter but one word before he collapsed in death. That one word was the word victory. But that one word changed the whole city of Athens. Fear was banished. Joy took hold. People began to understand life in a new way. Their perspective was altered. Suddenly things began to make sense. Do you understand that Jesus dying on the cross delivers the great message to the world, victory? And that message of victory changes everything. Suddenly, when we see Christ on the cross, we understand that our lives have meaning and purpose. Fear is banished. Joy takes hold. Everything in life suddenly begins to make sense. It is Jesus who brings light to darkened minds. I find it intriguing to note that more and more of the great minds of our day are acknowledging that fact. I note, for example, that recently a national magazine conducted a survey, a kind of a straw poll, I suppose, amongst our universities and our research institutions and our industrial laboratories. You know what they discovered? They discovered that as many as eight out of ten of our leading scientists and engineers in this country now acknowledge the existence of a supreme being and give themselves to the regular practice of a religious faith. Eight out of ten. I note, for example, that Alan Hayward, the world-renowned British scientist, has written a book called God Is, and in that book he declares that God is the being who has created this superb universe of ours, and that God is the God of Christianity. I note, for example, the, they were among the last words that he spoke, in fact, the words of Dr. Carl Jung, the great medical and social scientist, words he spoke in response to a reporter's question as to whether or not he believed in God. Dr. Jung replied, I don't have to believe God exists. I know he does. Or I note, for example, that last May, one day, the newspapers and the television carried the story of two great entertainers, Sammy Davis Jr. and Jim Henson, both of whom had died on that same day virtually at the same time. Little noticed, but infinitely more significant. Tucked away on the back pages was the notice of another death that day, the death of Walker Percy the physician-turned-novelist 
who I believe one day will be regarded as one of the great writers of the 20th century. Just shortly before his death, Walker Percy, in an interview, acknowledged openly and unashamedly that he believed in Jesus Christ, that he attended church regularly, and that he immersed himself in the study of the Bible. The interviewer, astonished in this modern age that such a great intellect would admit to such a naive belief in Jesus, asked Walker Percy why he believed. Walker Percy replied, what else is there? And the reporter countered by saying, what do you mean what else is there? There's humanism and atheism and Marxism and Buddhism and materialism and agnosticism. There's Hinduism and Islam. There's astrology. There's the occult. There's metaphysics. There's the New Age movement. What do you mean what else is there? Walker Percy simply replied, that's just what I mean. What else is there? What else is there indeed? Dear friends, the light of Jesus Christ can bring the brightness of God into the midst of your experience. And when Jesus Christ moves into a life, he replaces darkness with light, confusion with commitment, aimlessness with a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Jesus Christ brings light to darkened minds. Ah, but then think how Jesus Christ, our bright morning star, brings cheer to darkened spirits. One day a little boy was sitting on the front porch of the house of the village doctor. One of the doctor's patients came up to the front steps and, and said to the little boy, is your father in? The little boy replied, no, he's not. And so the patient said, well, then do you know where he is? I need him. And the little boy replied, no, I don't know exactly where he is, but wherever he is, he's helping someone. You know, I think that's a perfect parable of the presence of our Christ. Wherever there is trouble, wherever there is tragedy, wherever there is sin, wherever there is sorrow, there Christ is. Does the name Sylvia Likens strike a chord in your mind? She was a young girl some years back, was very much in the news. She was, I think, the, the first widely reported case of child abuse. Unfortunately, there is now this depressingly unending stream of such tragedies. But Sylvia Likens was the first to grab national attention. Her, her mother was dead. Her father was a carnival worker. He was away from home at extended periods of time, and during those absences, he boarded Sylvia with a woman named Gertrude Banaszewski. Now, Gertrude Banaszewski and her daughter Paula inflicted unspeakable tortures on young Sylvia Likens, so much so that when at last, mercifully, the young girl died, even the police authorities were shocked at the things that had been done to her. Gertrude Banaszewski and her daughter were given life terms in prison. When Mrs. Banaszewski was taken to the penitentiary in Indiana, a young preacher near that penitentiary took it upon himself to begin visiting with her. He visited there regularly. And in time, the results of those visits were recorded in a story in the Indianapolis Star. It seems that Bertru Gertrude Banaszewski had come to know Jesus Christ. She'd been baptized. She'd become a student of the Bible. She was pursuing her high school education. The circumstances of her life remained the same. She was and is in prison. But her life itself has been changed. 
In fact, they took a photograph of her and they showed it to the jurors in her case, the jurors who had looked at her day after day after day during the trial. Do you know that not a single one of those jurors recognized her? So changed was her appearance. Now I want to ask you something. Who on earth could love Gertrude Banaszewski? Christ could. And a servant of Christ could. And because of that love, the darkened spirit of Gertrude Banaszewski came to the light. Dear friends, life is hard. Sometimes it is terrifyingly hard. And sometimes in our sinfulness we make it harder than it needs to be. But the good news of the gospel is that we have a present Christ. He is with us in the midst of the battle of life. He is the balm to soothe and heal the wounded spirit. He is the strength to fire up the faint-hearted. He is the grace to make the sinful clean. He is the light to brighten the darkness of our experience. Jesus Christ brings cheer, the cheer of his peace, his power, and his pardon to darkened spirits. Oh, but then think also how Jesus Christ, our bright morning star, brings hope to darkened hearts. You know, for every one of us, there will come that day when the last and deepest darkness shall fall, when the spark of life itself is extinguished. Ecclesiastes calls it a time to die. And all of us will experience that time. Yet even in the last great darkness of death, even there we can see the light of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for now is Christ Jesus risen from the dead because he lives, you shall live also. Even in the darkness of death, the light of Jesus shines. Ernest Gordon has a magnificent book of Christian faith and hope and courage. It's a book called Through the Valley of the Kwai. And in that book, he tells the story of a young American soldier who one day was brought to the prison camp where Gordon himself was being held as a Japanese prisoner of war. The young soldier had been grievously wounded, and so he was placed in the makeshift prison hospital, and there Gordon was called upon to minister to him. It was a desperate case. Gangrene had set in. There was really no hope. The last darkness was beginning to fall. In the midst of that circumstance, the young soldier turned to Ernest Gordon and said, I'm afraid to die. And Ernest Gordon pledged himself there and then to try to overcome that boy's fear. And so for the next several days, Ernest Gordon spent every waking moment at that boy's bedside sharing with him the faith in Jesus Christ which Gordon himself had only recently come to know. And then the last darkness began to close in. The sad scene was illuminated only by the flame of a coconut oil lamp Suddenly, the young soldier reached out and grasped Ernest Gordon's hand and said to him, Jesus Christ is here, isn't he? And Ernest Gordon replied, yes, he's here. And the young soldier said, then I'm not afraid anymore. And with that, Ernest Gordon bowed his head and he began to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, and the young soldier still clinging tightly repeated the words, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom 
come. Suddenly, the oil lamp burned out and darkness descended. But Gordon continued the prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. No more sound. Suddenly, the grip loosened. Ernest Gordon placed the boy's hands at his side, smoothed the boy's hair, wiped his own tears from the boy's forehead, whispered a prayer, and walked out into the darkness. Did I say darkness? No. When Ernest Gordon walked out, even there in the midst of the hell of that prison camp, he looked up into the sky, and there was a bright, shining star. And Ernest Gordon knew it was the morning star, and he remembered the promise of his Christ, I am the bright morning star. And he knew that just as the morning star heralds the coming of the dawn, so Jesus Christ heralds the coming of eternal life. It is said that the night is the darkest just before the dawn. And that's why the brightest star that shines in the night sky is the star that shines in that deep darkness, the morning star. And when we see the morning star, we know the night will soon be over. The darkness will soon give way to the dawn. So Jesus said, I am the bright morning star. If you see the light of Jesus in your life, then any darkness in your life will soon give way to the dawn of new life in Jesus Christ. <laughs>